Okay, so we're very happy to have Tarek Ogindi from Duke uh, to talk to us about singularity formation in the oil and exploration. Okay, thank you very much for, for coming. Thank you, Bill, for the department for having me. Um, so today I want to discuss singularity formation in the oil And uh, so first, let me mention about the weather equation. It's derived by Euler in the 1700s and said to be the second TDE ever written. And, uh, the first one is the first. The wave equation. Yeah, that was there. 10 years earlier. <laughs> much, much simpler equation. Well, wow. uh, yeah, by itself, <laughs> a linear one. Um, and uh, it's supposed to model the incompressible flow. People call them ideal fluids. So uh, the idea is as follows: so you just uh, take a domain and assume that the fluid is fluid means particles are moving around. So you assume that particles cannot exit the domain, means that the fluid velocity is tangent to the boundary. And incompressibility, this means that the amount of particles entering the region is the same as the amount of particles exiting. So A is draw A. A is from any subject. And this is the same statement as can be interpreted as the integral on boundary A of U dot the normal on the boundary to be zero. Right? So the number of particles, so particles can be passing through, but if some come in, others have to come out, which by the divergence theorems is for every A, this is the same as. The, this is kind of the fundamental assumption. So use the use the diverging. That's so why use the velocity field. Okay, and by the computation from the Louisville theorem. ODEs. This is the same as if you look at the, the particle map. So the motion of particles is given by the velocity. How, how you define the, uh, the velocity? Right? So it's DDT particle of a particle that's at point X, point T is moving by the velocity at that point. Right? So divergence of u0 is the same as i is present preserved. By the present preserved. And then the, uh, I'm just going to rapidly explain what the Euler equation is from this point of view. Um, the Euler equation is valid just by uh, the minimization process. So we find the action. So you can view uh, fluid as just a motion of particles. So if you have the particles of time zero, 
and then they move around. And it will be an ideal fluid if it's a minimizer of this action. So you just on every T1 over T2. This is all. Okay, so uh, using a variation of principle, the minimizes over what? Uh, right, over all uh, exactly that <clears throat> by connecting by T1. They're given some given the end final point. distribution of the fluid. Yeah, so you give them the beginning and the final, then it's it's minimizing this action. It's like the two point one. Okay. So the solutions of Euler so you will you give the correspondence, the particle correspondence. Yeah. Going from T1 to T2. Exactly. T1 to T2. Yeah. So there are many ways to change the particles from this state to the final state. And the Euler solutions are those uh, the critical points of the action. This is so it's like minimizing a kinetic energy or something. Yeah, so this is this is the velocity square. This is minimizing kinetic energy. Okay, but you have to uh, keep the constraint that you're within this class. So without without this constraint, it's of course phi double dot is zero. That's, that's the usual thing. But with this constraint, the equation you get is that I'm not going to explain how you get this outside of the scope. It's just this is like a, a multiplier. So this is to keep the constraint that phi t is measure preserving. So you're staying in the class of trajectory now. And from there, once you recall that this is what u is, you just uh, observe that u satisfies. This is the this fast way to make the order. So this uh, key. Yeah. How, how do you get it to the beam of uh, it's not from it's like a it's like a correction, right? So you view it as uh, it's it depends on you, it's not a, it's not something universal. Okay, so it's like a correction. So one way you can view this is that you is the velocity is transporting itself. So the velocity, if you start at the point and you remove the point with the velocity, the velocity at this point should be the old velocity, right? That's the that's just this part, right? But if you do that, it's not necessary that you keep this condition, and so you add this to cancel the gradient part. That's nice. I'm sorry, it's because I want to get this right. So you're saying that this p is a function of u? Yeah, you can write it as a so if you you can write a formula for it in terms of u. Not a, but it's not easy to write it down. Is that way you can write it? Uh, I can write it now. So take the divergence of the equation. Divergence of this is zero. So the plus p is minus. That's the equation. That's kind of annoying, so that's <laughs> you just keep P as uh, what, what it is. And so you can view this. So you now, and this is uh, if the space we're talking about, so omega is in RD. So we're going to focus on P equal two or three. 
then uh, these are these equations. Right? There are the unknowns for you. And then there's another unknown and one more equation. So it's d plus one equation, c plus one equation. Of course, you could write, uh, insert the solution of that other equation for p and you just get something on the other. Okay, so this is, this is the oil equation. And um, some uh, important feature of this equation is conservation of kinetic energy. Which is that if you use a smooth solution, then this quantity in the side of the So this means that the uh, you know on a, the velocity can just grow everywhere, for example. So the total kinetic energy has to be finite. Of course, this doesn't prevent at some point from you becoming unbounded at a point or something like that. So this is the question we want to study. Question. Is it possible that smooth solution Will see become non smooth. It's like this is the singularity problem. Okay. <clears throat> Obviously, as you approach some time, the kinetic energy would need to be constant, but uh, it could become non smooth by becoming unbounded or something like that. P star is finite? Yeah, so it's finite. Okay. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> um, so uh, the goal of today's discussion is to study this problem and to explain some methods of how uh, you can construct a singularity. So, so this, if it becomes non smooth, we say that uh, you become singular at P star. Uh, so that's, so we're going to be talking about the partial answers in the yes direction. And just to sort of mention some, I guess, the philosophy of what we're doing, so some ideas that are good to keep in mind. So first of all is that uh, singularities should be So, uh, so what this means is that they should be forming in a relatively regular way. Right? So, uh, example of that would be of something as one dimension. If something uh, bump starts to concentrate and become self similar. That means you have a base function solution of the form f of e, something like one over t star minus t, output the form. That's what that would call a regular singular solution. Right? So that's something which happens, but it's not like a chaotic singularity. It's really 
like the outer crack similarity happens at one point. So is yeah. this are you expecting this for you or for me? Uh that's a good question. I I don't really know what is expected to happen for P. I never thought about that that much. But you should expect this for you or for its derivatives. Here it is. So if I understand correctly, you have a, a family of velocity fields whose L2 norm is constant. Yeah. And you're saying that if you are stupid about what kind of singularities you're allowing, it's obvious there will be some. But you want to, you don't care about the stupid one. You want good ones like this uh, to happen or not. Uh, so I want this to happen. And the other ones, I just have no idea how you would construct them. And they may not be possible to construct. I see. So there's, it's not like people know that there are idiotic singularities that couldn't possibly correspond to a fluid. They don't know any singularities. Right. Just say it. Yeah, there, there, there aren't any other examples. So, so then why would why a regular? Why? Yeah. Why, why do you say that they should no, be say they, they should be as in if you want to look for one, that's, uh, it's like when you want to prove something goes wrong, you don't want everything to be going wrong in the equation. Otherwise, you can't prove anything. But things have to be going wrong in the regular world. Okay, but first, from what Dennis just said, nobody knows if, if even everything can go wrong. That's correct. Okay. Nobody knows that. <laughs> no, I think this is just creative genius. He's going to make a very regular, concrete way it blows up. Okay. So we're just, so, I mean, that's, I'm just trying to understand. No, he's trying totally. to lead us. So he's saying, yeah, you're going to aim for this. Yeah, this because is the only, it's the only one anybody could ever be. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's just a, in general, in, 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 in the genre of trying to get counterexamples, you don't want to. Usually, they're very regular construction, even if you think about. Simple examples and other things. Like, uh, you try to construct a nowhere differentiable function, continuous function. You try to do it very haphazard, but you're never going to do it. It's usually like a self similar argument or something like that. Okay. There's, there's just an idea. It could be, could be wrong. So the second thing is it should be stable. Right? So stable means that. Uh, Small perturbation of the equation, small perturbation of the equation of theta, or, the, or even the equation, add a lower order term to the equation, shouldn't destroy the singularity. Right? Otherwise, again, it's very difficult to find it. Um, okay, so this. Generally, so you would want these things. Yeah, you want these. Things. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is what we want. And, and perturbation of the equation could, for example, mean perturb the domain. Uh, it could mean perturb the domain, or it could be uh, right. So let me. Yeah, thank you for asking about that. So the, the reason we want this is that actually the equation was the, the blow up will come from. Simplified model. In fact, we'll view the Euler equation as a perturbation of something else. So the uh, singularity is going to be very clear on a, a simplified equation. And the, the whole strategy is to show that the blow up there can be carried over to the original Euler equation. For, for any domain. Uh, yeah, this is a very local thing. So it's on, it's basically a point. Up to symmetries, so we need to impose some symmetries on domain. It's not effective. <clears throat> okay.
All right, so now we want to turn to asking how singularity could occur. Well, what has to happen? So, uh, classical PDD point of view is that if you have an equation like the Euler equation, where the most of let's forget about the PDD, it doesn't do much. Um, if you have an equation like this, so it's mainly transport by uh, velocity field here, uh, singularity only happens for smooth solutions if the gradient of u becomes infinite. Classical PE for u is the gradient of u goes infinity. Let's see. So that's another point. If we're not uh, we're not searching for you know scenarios with second derivative of velocities growing or something like that. We only have to worry about uh, about this. So if this doesn't go to infinity. Then there's no solution. So John, this is a necessary and sufficient condition for. Okay. Now, since the divergence of u is zero, and since we're in three dimensions, I'm really focusing on three dimensions. At some point, sometimes I'll talk about two dimensions, but really most of this talk is about three dimensions. So since the divergence of the velocity is zero, then uh, if the gradient of u goes to infinity, um, the expectation is that the, actually the current of u, which is vorticity, should be what goes to infinity. So there's a slight refinement of this we can do using the fact that the divergence of u is zero to state that there's a blow up. This is the real type of my So a singular, uh, sorry, small solution comes single with two stars. If and only if we limit two goes to three stars. Integral of the soup norm of the vorticity of okay. So this is a sort of classical result. So this is uh, this motivates us to try to study the pointwise growth of this one. What's BKN? Bale, Cato, and Meyer. So this motivates that we should study the pointwise growth. Of omega. So again, it's just the term of the velocity. Okay. Now, it satisfies a very nice looking equation. So if you just take the curl, the good thing about taking the curl is it gets rid of this uh, pressure term. We don't really understand it. Well. The vorticity is transported by the velocity. This is called the transport curve. And then it's stretched 
by the gradient intervals. Okay. So this is called vortex stretching. And it's called transport. And this is uh, how the vorticity evolves. Of course, transport just means that the, the vorticity is moving around. So that doesn't affect the soup norm. It says there's no effect on the soup norm. Or just say no direct effect. And this, uh, and the growth can only be coming. So the, the growth of vorticity comes with it. But of course, the, the transport term would change the, the, the geometry of the shape of the vorticity in such a way that makes it favorable or less favorable for it to be growth conditions. Because at the end, the vorticity, omega, and the velocity are related through this. And um, in fact, you can, you can write a formula for the velocity in terms of the vorticity. So since omega is zero, and the omega is the curve of u, then you can write that the, we just take the curl of this equation. So the curl, curl of the divergence free vector field is just minus the Laplacian. So the curl of the vorticity minus the Laplacian velocity. And thus you can solve for the velocity. Sense about why there's no effect of that first term u dot gradient omega on the infinity norm it seems wrong. And so, if you, if you just if, so, I should say no direct effect. It means if it acts alone, it acts, if it acts alone, it means if the right hand side is zero, then it just means that uh, omega is constant on trajectories. No. Oh, it's constant on trajectory. Yeah. So it doesn't change the soup, it just moves vorticity around. It doesn't change the magnitude. Yeah, you have the gradient vorticity. Yeah. I mean, you can view this as. Oh, I see. You're just examining the vorticity and how it varies by traveling along view and seeing how it changes. Yeah. Okay, fine. Yeah. Okay, I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this plus this is, is the same as the Euler equation. Mm -hmm. Now I can erase the original one. Right? <laughs> so now this. No, no. This is a Euler equation in, in vorticity form in three dimensions. What? This is the, the Euler equation in vorticity form oh. in three dimensions. Yeah. In three dimensions. Is there, is there some classical, like, is this some kind of Hamiltonian system from the Lagrangian one or something like that? Or, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure. I don't know. Some kind of change of variables, right? So, yeah, I mean, vorticity is just Lee transported. So, yeah, no the <coughs> Okay, so, so, so again, we want to understand the dynamics of this equation and. Uh, Essentially, two things we want to observe observations we want to make. So, we want to study the 
dynamics. The first part. Forgetting that u and omega are related. So if I give you a u and an omega, how uh, how an omega evolve? Right. So this really what we want to know is more about shape and things like that. Right. So are you saying that omega is this is an equation for omega given u? Yeah, you can view this as an equation for omega given u, and then u is determined later by, by omega, right? Intersection so to surface. Yeah, I guess. And the second thing is we want to understand if we have information about omega, how do we derive information about u? Right? So we want to understand. Okay, so this is some Integral operator, which we're going to discuss. Mm -hmm. What's the gain for the, this Green's function for that boundary condition? Oh, uh, let's forget about the boundary. It's a straight line, it's on the whole space. <coughs> okay. So now, um, now we talk about transport. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> and let, let me start this by some uh, one dimensional examples. Um, which shows sort of the peculiarity of so how, how these two terms can interact. This is really simple example. If you consider this uh, simple equation, one dimension. Okay. Here we have x is on the real line, or x is on the real infinity, right? which means this transport part means particles are being pushed out that way. Right? And this part means that uh, particles, uh, the value tries to go exponentially. Right? So if you just think of this by itself, right? So this is exponential in time growth. Right? And this is uh, and this is just part. Okay? You have exponential time growth plus something that just changes the location for us. So you would think that this means that the solution has to grow exponentially. Right. So, uh, in fact, it's not. So, if you assume for maybe for symmetry reasons or something like that, that f times zero let me write this. So, if you're solving the initial value problem, but if you assume That half initially vanishes at this point, then that is bounded uniformly on on compact. It's just uh, just a computation. So if you compute what happens to uh, Solution of this okay. solution formula is just f is to the p that's the solution of course. So it's the growth on top of transport, right? So you have transport out, and you have if you have this assumption 
for symmetry reasons or whatever, maybe you have to assume that. Then uh, you see that this solution, even though it looks like it's growing, if you fix a compact set, it's uniform enough. Right? See what I'm saying? What is that F0? Point because the bandwidth is still bounded by that. It's just the uniform bounds. So, this is how uh, transport term, even though transport term doesn't change the, uh, uh, the size of solutions by itself, it can inhibit this from uh, causing particles to go exponential. Does that make sense? So this is why I like transport versus what's expecting because there are going to be situations where this term causes growth, but then this term completely stops the growth. Even though it doesn't change the size itself, it changes the location, which in effect will um, stop the growth. So now this mentioned since we have such a simple example, let me mention a, a small thing. Now if that zero and zero is zero, but it's not not lip shift, maybe it's just C1 F something like that. Maybe F zero X is like square root of X, X goes to zero. Okay. Then you see from this formula that the effect of this transport is weaker than this. Right? If you just take the square root, you get e to the t over two. You see what I'm saying? So depending also on the regularity of the data, um, you can favor one term over the other. So this was one is one observation we made that. If you go to low regularity, the smoothing effect of this term will be, um, can be completely removed. All right. <coughs> well, if the omega were coming in like the square root, yeah, then the right hand term is got the is not lost is lost. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's it. That's still changed it a little, just still blowing out. But yeah, the growth rate is how fast it's blowing out is smaller. Yeah. I mean, if it wasn't vanishing, then it would be great. It would blow up. But usually it has to vanish. So in the smooth class, so for smooth solutions, it might be global, it might be bounded, no growth. But then, if you if you make the decay weaker, then you can have growth. From the term on the on the right. From the term on the right. So I'm gonna give a specific example. I'm gonna actually show. This is actually a very good model. Believe it or not, this is exactly how we work. If you change coordinates, this is actually. Uh, yeah, in a certain point. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly what you think. It's kind of funny. Okay, so now uh, this is basically what I wanted to mention about the structure. So uh, just to, to make this point a little more uh, close to reality, what's, what's happening here is that the vorticity can only grow in uh, expanding directions of the velocity. So for the vorticity to grow, the, it has to grow along a direction where the gradient of U has a positive eigenvalue. Right? Really, if you want to think about growth of omega, you have to have this thing right? So this is the vector problem. Right? So this has to be positive. So omega should be aligned with the positive eigendirections of gradient, which are the expanding directions of the velocity. 
right? So in order to, to have growth, you're forced into a situation where the particles also are trying to leave that location. Right? So you're essentially forced into a situation like this. It would be great if uh, you have something like that. So particles are going, concentrating toward the point, and then there's definitely growth. But um, the Euler equation, how it's built, is uh, such that this really basically always tries to stop the growth of this point. So the blow up, they can't get away fast enough. Yeah, uh, no, it can't stay long enough. That's why it does not blow up. So it moves away fast, so it doesn't blow. Okay. Tries not to. Blow up happens if they don't get away fast enough. Yes. Exactly. <clears throat> All right. So now let me try to talk about the second point. Yes. Okay. Okay, so one of the other serious problems with the weather equation is that it's to understand the non locality. So, again, the, the velocity is determined now by the vorticity. Now, Assuming that we're in a regime where, as, as Dennis said, this term is k, we can sort of just forget about this term. We assume that we're in such a regime where vorticity is not going to vanish very fast at a point where there's supposed to be growth. So let's, let's forget about this term for a moment. And we want to understand uh, really the gradient of you. We want to understand what the gradient is. So now we have to think about this operator. This is the uh, Calvin operator. Okay, so you, you have two derivatives of omega, and then you take the Laplacian inverse. So it sounds like you didn't do anything, um, but it's really think of it as an operator of order zero. So uh, normally you write these operators as an integral, multiple value integral. This done with the assumption that it's in full space. Yeah. So the point is that in order to know the gradient of velocity at a point, you need to know the vorticity everywhere. Right? Furthermore, the scale, um, so this is like a matrix here, but uh, it's usually not something with, a, with good monotonicity problems. So if you have some shape, again, remember what I said in the beginning is we want some kind of self-similar solution. So a shape that reproduces itself in the equation. So you need to think about uh, monotonicity and things like that. But it's not clear at all how from this formula you deduce properties about gradient U just from the qualitative form. So um, the observation we made, so if we write this as uh, Choice of operators. So this is always S of omega this time. So singular, S is for singular. Um, so this is an operator. So the observation we make is that uh, in certain circumstances. We can rewrite this singular integral operator as uh, 
very simple to understand uh, operator. Simple to understand. Multiplied by a very large constant, dominant plus uh, another operator which is difficult to understand, but uh, it's lower order compared to this. This has a very big constant. So this is, uh, let me explain exactly what, what I'm saying. So let me, um, let me just, this is easiest to explain in two dimensions. So this is in, in any dimension. So this is such a class to any dimension. So let's, let's just talk about two dimensions. So, and let's fix, uh, Particular operator rather than its whole matrix. Let's particular, fix a particular one. So let's look at the operator uh, S of omega is D1, D2. Is it, is it, so I, I just get confused because in 3D, the green operator is extremely different from 2D. Yeah, so but all of this we're taking the gradient. So the oh, gradient, so is the derivatives are, are just dimensions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The derivatives <coughs> So, um, so you took one derivative of your log root, right? And then it's okay. Um, right, so. Uh, if you consider this case, say d1, d2, Laplacian inverse, a uh, well known fact is that it's bounded uh, from the alpha to the alpha. So, okay, you should probably intersect to L2 or something to deal with decay at infinity, but. Um, uh, so C alpha is a whole different continuous degree alpha, but that the operator norm the bounds blow up when alpha goes to zero. The linear operator is bounded in everything, but the operator norm goes to infinity when alpha goes to zero. Right? So this is a this is a classical fact. This is the other side. Say that. Yeah. You're on the other side of the inequality. Oh, sorry, which other side? <laughs> no, 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 it doesn't. Sorry. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Oh. <laughs> um, so now we want to understand, so now I want to understand the reason for this. For this one of our. It turns out that it's basically just one thing that goes wrong. It's basically one problem. And otherwise, the operator is actually done. So if you try to think of a counter example, so this is 75% you know, of my thesis was, was thinking about this as a problem. Um, and the counter example, so counter example. The alpha and zero. Um, is that, is it actually almost five fifth? It's five twenty four, but I started late. So. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm very sorry. Um, so I'll start to go fast. Okay. <clears throat> so if you consider this function, Size S one two log X So then the Laplacian of psi, because X one X two is a harmonic function, Laplacian of psi you can see is, is bounded, and it's fact a constant 
some uniformly bounded function, and that uses uh, that this is harmonic. So any other second order polynomial you put here, this is not going to hold. Right? That's not harmonic. But on the other hand, d1, d2 of psi is exactly plus bound. You have when 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 you just look at bounded functions, L infinity to L infinity, it's not true. But if you try to think hard for any other counterexample, you won't find it. Any reasonable one. Obviously, if you start putting things that are uh, non smooth at many points or things like that, you try to think of any reasonable counterexample, you won't find one. But algebraically, this is the only one. So it's like the nice polynomial. Yeah. 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 So the statement you can make is the following. So, so among functions, you are smooth in the argument. But I'm thinking in the radial coordinates. So functions that are smooth in R to the alpha. So that's like a prototypical example of a C alpha function, something smooth in, in R to the alpha. You can uh, make this expansion. S is one over alpha. Um, L plus S tilde where L of omega is a radial function. And it's only given by this one. And S still that is uniformly bounded independent of alpha on unreasonable spaces and solar spaces. Again, in this in that way. Okay, so this is this radial, and only sees the component of omega in the direction of this uh, harmonic problem. Right. So x one, x two, x one, x two is exactly r squared. Uh, So here, here S is, is the operator B1 to the plus one. All right. So now, with all this in mind, um, you can write that expansion for the gradient of U. And then, if you believe me that the transport is gone, then we just have to study this equation that work in the right scenario. Transport term. So you put the transport term on the right hand side. And then you break gradient of U into its main part and not main part. This L is like some matrix. Okay, it's not, let me just give it L delta. It's different from that one, but it has essentially the same property that it's a radial function, which is gotten just by integrating against some relevant um, spherical model. And then you have this plus this, which is kind of bounded independent of alpha. And thus, you only need to study the equation at this time. 
And now you see this is a very nice equation because um, this is radial. And so the angular part of omega just factorizes to the equation. It's independent of time. Right? So you say you do an expansion in, in, in Spherical harmonics. spherical harmonics, you just need to study the radial parts, and they're all decoupled. Right? And then you end up, you, answer, I don't have time, you get a bunch of 1D equations for uh, this form. Right? And now, if you think about it, it's very easy to see that the function which Looks like that. Um, so this is a radio. This is S0. Then the solution develops in the learning by the time. And it grows. Uh, in fact, this I define this with G. And Mm -hmm. So, G is initially positive, it goes up in time. That, that we know. Okay. <laughs> this one, this is, once you have this one, that is heavy. So, in fact, the whole thing is a perturbation. Ah, that's great. So, then you can get a singularity for C1 alpha velocity, or kind of energy eventually. More questions for Mr. Yes. Uh, have you played with an animation of the clock or the clock? Uh, okay. You want the three dimensional version? Do a dance. <laughs> <laughs> you want uh, whichever is easier. So this one is really easy. Oh. Uh, but uh, what's, what happens is that there's only three dimensions. Because the solution in the end, I didn't get the chance to say anything. It's, it's axisymmetric. So you, uh, you take data which is invariant under rotations and fix the, the z axis. And then you also assume, you also take data for which the velocity in this direction is zero. Then it reduces to a scalar equation, it reduces to just a Vorticity only has one non zero component. And uh, what well, I think the, the example is really the smoke rings. So you have like smoke ring. And it's not, it's decaying at the axis very slow. Right? So the vorticity of a smooth uh, solution. Would have to decay linearly at the axis, right? But for us, it'll only decay a little bit because we're trying to kill that transport. This is the main reason why it's not a smooth solution. We have a vortex of like the smoke ring up here and the smoke ring down here, and they're such that the velocity they induce, so this is like positive one, is negative. And then they come down and they expand at the same time. What about the direction of vorticity? What happens to it? The direction of vorticity it stays constant. So I'll make e theta is the only direction. What's e theta? It's the this one. So what's the statement? But the direction of vorticity stays constant. It's constant. It's this. Oh, but vorticity is only one. Yeah. How do you change other equations in the distance of that? <laughs> oh, <laughs> you can add viscosity. I mean, this whole thing doesn't work. So you've got to measure slopes, and you know what's happening. 
But um, now, if you modify the scenario, this is things that we're doing now, you could uh, perhaps get a smooth solution in the end with a different scenario. And if that's possible, then uh, it's not clear how you know, how to modify the equation to, to stop something like that. It could be that something like this is even physical, it may not be unphysical. I mean, it, it may be that, you know, some abrupt changes happen or after some time, the equation doesn't, or even, uh, I guess there are experiments, which were very, uh, with very rough data, where you're not sure even experimentally what should happen. It's not, it's not clear that one would want to modify. I don't know if that makes sense. How about the periodic case? It's completely local. So I don't think there's any, we didn't really look at that, but it's completely local. So I don't think there's a change. When you said not locality up there, what, what were you referring to? The, 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 the integral, the Graham's function. Yeah. Well, I asked about that before. Uh, you said it's okay. So you're taking the whole taking the whole space and way. Okay. So that's that's what you mean by the non locality. Yeah. You have the integral on the whole space. So what happens if you're not working on the whole space? No, but if non locality also means for one mile, it affects it, right? Yeah. yeah. That's what it means. No, I know what. What non locality means. No, but I did not know from him what, what he, what he uh, meant by it. But so now, if you, if you, uh, if you have a boundary domain, yes, I mean, the singularity meter x equals y is the same. Yes. But does it, does it change anything about the. the I, I don't think so, because for the, the difference between this, the, the, the Green's function on R3 and the Green's function in say a domain. So if the singularity is going to happen at a point, then the, the effect can actually be probably controlled by the limits. So the, the, the remainder term is smooth. Yeah, smooth. Yeah, yeah, the difference is that hard. Yeah. As long as if singularity is happening on the boundaries. And there's maybe maybe it's a boundary effect. So that would be different. That's like the liquid splashing on the boundary or something. Yeah. Yeah. The smoke rings you drew, are they represented symbolically here or am I not able to see it? So you drew this as the example. Yeah. Is, is that, are we supposed to be able to read that off from what you've written so far? Uh, from what I've written on the map? No. Okay. Now I was trying to relate it to, to yeah. um, okay. There's a lot of stuff going on. So it's difficult to. I just wanted to give the big picture, but the, really what, what all of this is doing, uh, the sequence of things that you, you go from the Euler equation, you assume axis symmetry goes well. And then if you make all of these reductions, you find that the, the axial vorticity does satisfy basically this equation. Right. So, uh, so now it should be clear. Okay, if there are no other questions, let's think about it.